Um, so today I'm presenting some work on how we can think about regulating algorithmic decisions when, is this too loud? Is, is this any better? Okay, great. Um, sorry for that. Uh, on, algorithm, on basically regulating algorithmic decisions when the output of the algorithm can be so complex that it may not be fully understood by the regulator. So the motivation for this talk is that we increasingly rely on prediction algorithms in many high-stakes screening decisions. To give you just a few, um, we can, for example, think of medical testing, or of hiring, of lending. And in many of these cases, there may be incentives co conflicts between the maker of the algorithm and the ultimate um, user that uh, we're interested in, or more generally, between the party that um, constructs the algorithm, what I will call the agent in my model, and a principal who oversees its use. So in the three examples I just introduced, let me give you a very concrete example. So in medical testing, for example, you could think that there's insurance companies that is worried that a hospital that uses some predictive technology in order to assign people to testing may overpredict risk because they may benefit from running more tests. In a case of hiring, you may be worried that a company that hires um, a hiring agency uh, in order to screen applicants may not necessarily incorporate their preferences around diversity or inclusion uh, or equity of the job offers. And in lending, which will be the main focus of my talk today as an example, you may be worried um, that the lender may make credit decisions that are not necessarily um, representing the risk preferences or the fairness goals that one of the um, involved regulators has here. So for example, in the US, the CFPB may care about disparate impact, meaning about making sure that the credit decisions are not taken systematically differently between different groups in society. Um, or some other regulators may care about the overall risk portfolio that a bank has because they're worried that in a downturn there may be a systematic shock um, to the credit market. And so um, in all of those cases, there is both an opportunity and a challenge from the increased use of algorithms. So I would say there's first and foremost a, an opportunity because as we move from basically humans making decisions to algorithms making decisions, there's a chance that we can describe much more in mathematical terms what's actually going on, which can make regulation much more effective because we can more uh, precisely and often already before things happen describe what's going on. But at the same time, there's also a challenge because these algorithms are very complex and very hard to fully describe. And there's therefore a question how we can effectively regulate and mitigate such incentive conflicts between a regulator and a lender, for example, if the algorithms that are used in order to take such high-stakes decisions are basically black boxes that, are not, um, that we are not able to fully describe, as I kind of illustrate by this neural network here, which unlike a simple, say, logistic regression, just has far too many um, parameters to fully describe or to allow even the, the algorithm maker to fully understand what's going on. And the starting point for our approach in this paper is that the complexity of algorithms necessarily means that the agent cannot fully describe to the regulator what the algorithm does. So I'm assuming that the algorithm is so complex that in communicating about the algorithms, there will necessarily be some information loss because we can't describe it fully. Um, a first option that we consider in our model will therefore be that we could just ask the agent to use only simple algorithms that can be fully described. So that would be equivalent to telling the lender who wants to use a neural network, say, in order to take credit decisions, to require them to use some simple logistic regression that can be described in a few parameters, which would enable us to regulate much more effectively because we can now fully describe the model, but at the same time would also lead to inefficiencies because the um, um, agent now has to use an overly simple model that may not do a very good job. We therefore also consider a second policy option, which is the use of explainer tools or of some technology that basically describes the complex model in a simple way. Um, and the idea that the principal could instead require the agent to provide a simple explanation of what the algorithm does in terms of some key drivers. So for those of you who have engaged with explainability in machine learning, a typical way of doing that is basically that I take my black box and then I run some model explainer or model descriptive tool that identifies which are the main variables that matter for the output. For example, by perturbing the input features, 
and then distributing the predictive power of the algorithm between those different features. So one technology that does that is called SHAP, which basically uses ideas from Shapley values in order to associate predictive powers of the different in, um, to, the, to the different inputs of the algorithm. And such diagnostic tools are widely available. They're already used in finance. Um, and so we were basically interested here in understanding to which degree can such explainers that describe the complex model in simple ways help us overcome the challenge of the regulator in fully understanding the algorithm. And so what do we do in this paper and what will I lay out in the next um, 20 minutes or so? So first, theoretically, we make precise and justify um, explanations um, of complex machine learning models in a principal agent model where explainability is a means to an end. So my view in the literature here um, on, the, on the very last row here is that there are widely available diagnostic tools. So computer science is producing explainability tools that even work for very complex models and give you a few key drivers and say that here are the main variables that really drive, um, drive, drive the predictions. However, they are often based on either technical implementations or mathematical axioms that don't necessarily have a clear economic justification or don't really clearly define what it actually means to explain the model. So the way I think about it, to paraphrase something that um, a researcher in the fairness literature, Debbie Hellman, said about fairness, is just like for fairness, fairness, uh, she said, is like, you know, nobody can really define what fairness exactly is, but we all agree it's a good thing. It's a little bit the same with explainability. Like, we all say that algorithms have to be explainable, but we don't really agree on what that exactly means. And so many of those mathematical definitions don't necessarily have a clear translation into an economic model. And so what the first thing that we want to do here is basically we want to write a model where explainability is not an end in itself, but is instead a means to an end. And thereby we want to derive what it means in our model to make a model explainable. Um, and then we will show that ex ante restrictions, so those restrictions that simply tell the agent to use a very simple model in order to avoid the challenge of not being able to explain the model, are generally inefficient because the cost in restricting the agent to these simple models is, outweighed, um, is, is outweighing the, the benefit of being able to regulate completely. We then secondly show that um, model, explainable, um, model explanation tools that basically summarize the properties of the model in a simple way um, can improve the ability of the regulator to regulate effic effic um, efficiently. However, um, we also show that standard ways of doing that, which simply focus on describing the first order behavior of the tool, are generally inefficient and not the right way of constructing such explanations, because we should instead focus on the specific source of the incentive conflict, rather than just focusing on the first order model behavior. Um, we then empirically demonstrate that these results matter in the concrete example of credit underwriting, where we show that explaining credit underwriting models in different ways um, serves different purposes and specifically doing it in the right way can improve um, regulatory oversight in the case of reducing disparate impact or increasing fairness. And then finally, I also want to link this to an ongoing project we've been involved in for over two years now with Fingdag Lab, which is a policy advisory in DC who is working um, on understanding how regulation applies to fintechs and how regulation um, has to evolve in the light of an increasing use of um, complex algorithms in fintech. And so we just published a report two months ago where we basically analyzed to which degree existing model diagnostic tools that are offered commercially by companies are actually in a position to um, address regulatory requirements, in this case in the US. So by doing that, we kind of try to build a theoretical model, then validate empirically that these results matter for practice, but also link it to current regulatory um, practice. OK, this is related to, to a few strands of the literature. So first of all, there is a nascent literature um, in economics um, that talks about incentive conflicts and algorithmic design and their inter intersection. So here, what, what we specifically focus on is applying a principal agent toolbox to the case where the algorithms in this context are too complex to fully describe, so that we're not actually able to uh, do a full audit that fully understands the algorithm. There's also a finance literature on disclosure and supervision that is related to the model we have here, um, where we, again, kind of focus on the case where the disclosure design is so that available information is limited, um, and then compare different constraints that the, that the regulator can impose here. And then finally, there is an exploding computer science literature on explainability that I briefly alluded to before, 
Um, and here we specifically focus on what it means to be explainable and how we can conceptualize explainability in an economic model rather than from a purely technical or axiomatic mathematical foundation. Okay, so I'm now going to talk through the model that we have, but I'm very quickly going to go into a very concrete example to make the relatively high-level comments I made so far very concrete um, within our model. So what is our general model? So we assume that there is some agent, and that agent chooses a prediction function or a classification function or an assignment decision, so a mapping from some covariance x to either a prediction or to a decision, for example, who to give credit. And when faced with a decision, f of x, and a realization y, incurs some loss. Um, so some standard cases would be that I run a prediction where the x's are some covariates and I want to predict some continuous outcome, and the loss I incur may, for example, be mean squared error, so I'm taking a squared error loss in that case. A second case, if I'm classifying, um, so if my outcome is 0 or 1, and in, I'm, I'm predicting it by a probability, could be that I'm taking negative log likelihood and I end up with log loss here. Um, a third case could be that I'm actually de deciding based on my predictions who to assign credit to. And so in this case, both my outcome y and my prediction f of x is binary. And I'm incurring a loss when I'm making a type one error, when I'm making a type two error. Um, and my goal is to basically minimize that average loss. So I assume that this agent receives some signals. So think of this as very practically. The agent has a training sample and uses past data in order to um, learn about the relationship of y to x. Um, and then chooses an algorithm. However, I also assume that there's oversight by a principal who may have a different preference. So throughout the talk today, although that's not relevant um, for the high level results, I'm just assuming that the agent just um, minimizes risk, so minimizes the expected loss, or in this case, I'm writing as a utility, so maximizes the minus of the expectation of loss, while the um, principal in general maximizes some welfare function may differ from that. I'm going to give some very concrete examples on the next slide. And the main constraint in this model is that the function f that the um, agent chooses is too complex for the principal to understand completely. Otherwise, we would be in a case where the principal could simply dictate which function should be chosen. But because I'm assuming that that's not possible, I cannot fully describe that function. I now have to think about what I can learn about the function and how I have to restrict complexity. So let me make this now very concrete in a case of landing. So from until now, I basically talked about a principal and an agent. From now on, I'm just going to talk about the concrete case of a lender and a regulator. And I'm concretely thinking that the lender takes a credit scoring or loan approval decision. So that just means, in my case, the outcome y it's going to be binary. It's going to be zero if the person does not repay their loan. It's going to be one if the person repays their loan. I'm the lender, so my goal in providing credit is to learn who is likely going to repay their loan. So I'm engaging in a prediction exercise or classification exercise where I want to determine the probability of a person with given set of characteristics x, which would be their credit file, repaying their loan. And based on that, I will decide whether to give them credit. And I could either think of just some generic loss function that is a loss function of the probability I have relative to the true realized label. So this is basically a credit score if you think of effectively running a logit here. And I could just in general think that I want to get as close to that probability as possible because I take many decisions based on that, like how to set the interest rate, whether to give credit, and so on. So in general, I would be interested to just get as close as possible um, to the probability that somebody actually repays their loan. I could also directly think of the cost and benefit of me providing loans and then the person paying it back or not, where I would basically have some profit if I give somebody credit and they pay it back, and I have some loss if I give somebody credit and they don't pay it back, and I can now use what I know about my cost and my benefit in order to decide what the threshold is for who I want to give credit to or not. The training signal would then be basically receiving some past data on past defaults in order to train my model that maps the credit file x to a probability of repayment um, f of x. And the choice in this case would be seen overseen by a regulator, which um, in the US, for example, could be the CFPB that is concerned about equity, um, or could be another regulator that is concerned about risk. And so very specifically, I'm going to use two concrete examples here. First example is I'm assuming that there's a difference in risk preference between the lender and the regulator. 
So to be very concrete, I assume the lender just wants to uh, minimize um, average loss or maximize um, the average utility. So that would be equivalent to somebody profit maximizing based on the cost and benefit of them providing loans. While the regulator doesn't just integrate over states of the world, but the regulator takes a worst case utility over different realizations of the economy because they don't just care about the expected outcome, but they want to make sure that even in a bad state of the economy, the credit market doesn't collapse. So specifically here, I'm just assuming that there's a high state of the economy. So U equals high would be a high state of the economy and a low state of the economy, which would be um, U equals low. And I'm now, rather than taking average over those two states, Minimi um, taking as my welfare the minimum of the utility across those two states, so that in this case the regulator may actually disagree with the decisions of the lender if the lender takes decisions that may turn bad in a bad state of the economy. A second canonical example here would be that of disparate impact or fairness. So it's one specific way in which a regulator may care about credit provision being fair. So here I'm still assuming that the um, lender simply minimizes risk or in this case, that could mean maximizes their profit. But the regulator also has an interest that credit is not provided too unequally across groups. So for example, assume we have um, black applicants and white applicants in our sample, then the regulator may be interested in making sure that the um, overall average rate at which credit is approved across different groups is approximately the same. And so the difference between these rates across groups <laughs> Um, at least in the US context, we usually call disparate impact. Um, and there are usually constraints on how much disparate impact there can be across groups, which here in a very simplified man manner, I just describe as that the regulator incurs some additional cost if basically the um, rate of approvals or the average credit scores across different groups are different and would prefer the lender to choose an allocation that is more equal. Max? No, so I, I think that the way that we've written the paper right now, I'm, I want to do that to anchor it in a very concrete example. This is not specific, so think of it as basically a lender receives some signal and chooses some um, policy, and the main constraint is that I can't learn everything about that policy. But because we are very concretely anchored in the practice that is already happening in financial markets, I'm going to basically talk about this simplified signal as a simple representation of a function of x to, to the outcome. But it's not specific um, to the setup. Um, so, say more. What do you mean? I mean, there is a specific functional form to work for that type of, of separation of period of alignment. Yeah, so I'm not. So, in, in the paper, basically, the case for which we explicitly saw that we basically assume that we can approximate loss loss function by quadratic loss function, and then we are in a sim similar case to the aligned delegation literature that in some cases shows us how we can align. Um, here I'm keeping it relatively um, high level and I basically want to talk in general about different strategies we could use here and how they rank order. Um, but I, I hope that we can provide a little bit more structure about the explainers that I'm about to show, which so far we don't have a good theoretical characterization except for in the case of quadratic laws. Well, thanks for the question. Okay, so um, to illustrate this now very concretely, I'm focusing on the risk example for my theoretical illustration, and then if I have time at the end, I'm going to show some numbers um, for the case of disparate impact. And I'm just assuming that there are two variables, x1 and x2. They are both binaries, so basically my complex function that I um, introduced as kind of a neural network before is now just a function that is represented by four numbers. But I'm basically going to assume that those four numbers are too complex for the regulator to understand and that the regulator is only able to understand a simple representation. I'm doing that to give you the most, uh, the, the simplest, uh, most transparent example that I could think of here. And concretely, I'm, I'm therefore can write basically the object of interest here, which is the probability of repaying the loan in terms of four parameters. I'm assuming concretely, if you want to think of those variables in concrete terms, that you know, one of the variables could be, did this person who I consider giving credit to default in the past? Um, another one could be, does this person um, have a home equity loan of credit? Which I realize I misspelled here, so this is HELOC with an E in the second. Um, and then um, I assume that the agent, who is the lender here, just wants to uh, minimize the expected um, risk. And the, um, the regulator, wants to um, instead 
um, maximize the um, minimal utility across states or here minimize the maximal risk across different states and I'm just using mean squared error here to keep it very simple. And crucially, I assume that the parameter of the model can actually depend on whether the economy is in a higher um, low state. So I'm basically assuming that in the case where the economy is in a high state, the probability of repayment is higher generally, but also that specifically having a home equity loan of credit may be seen as a positive signal when the economy is in a good state, because that may show that that person um, has some additional collateral that they can use, and we may generally see that as a positive signal, while in a low state of the economy, we may be worried that somebody who has an additional credit on the equity may actually have liquidity constraints and may therefore be hit harder by the economy. So we think of this as basically as one variable in our model that may be specifically um, affected in its effect on repayment by the economy turning bad. And then I'm making assumptions here to just make this very tractable so that I can actually show you an explicit solution, which is basically that those two variables are independently distributed, that the distribution of the axis um, is known, um, and that basically in the high state, um, um, that the high state is the frequent state and the low state is something that happens only infrequently, and that the probability of repayment is higher in the high state and lower in the low state. I will then learn to return to disparate impact later when I talk about some empirical examples. So here is the timing of our game. I first assume that the regulator sets the rules of the game. In the training stage, the lender then learns the relationship between the X covariates and the um, probability of default. So this is basically shorthand for saying the lender uses a lot of data, squeezes it, runs an algorithm on it in order to find out that relationship. And then based on that comes up with a prediction or an allocation function that without loss of generality, because there are only two variables that are both binary, I can just write in terms of uh, four parameters in this linear model. Um, afterwards, the regulator performs an audit based on limited information about the function that is chosen by the lender. And I'm going to be more precise about what I mean by this. Uh, before in the outcome stage, basically utilities are realized. And I'm assuming here that basically the regulator can fail the, um, can fail the lender and that incurs uh, minimum negative utility, um, sorry, the minimum infinite utility, meaning basically the regulator can impose constraints um, on the lender based on the information that the lender will adhere to. So the crucial part of our model is that we assume that this function cannot be fully understood by the lender. And as I said before here, I'm assuming that the complex function is this four-dimensional object and that the um, regulator can only understand a low-dimensional explainer of that, which here I simply take to be a projection of this function that depends on x1 and x2 on one of those variables. And so the main idea is that by choosing such a projection or choosing such an explanation, I now have a choice which part of the model I want to learn about. And that's because when the model is complex and I can only understand limited information about it, there's inherent um, a consequential decision here, which is which of the information in the model do I want to preserve when I explain it in simple terms. To be very concrete here, I have a model that can depend on um, X1 and X2, so it theoretically has these four different areas where I can take different values. I'm now assuming that there are basically two ways of explaining that model. I either project it on the first variable or I project it on the second variable. But in general, you can think of this as I'm basically taking the complex space of functions and I'm projecting it into some simpler space and I'm understanding the world, or in this case, the prediction function through what that simpler space is. And this is like the simplest possible implementation of that I could think of. Um, and now to make more precise what it means to set the rules, so I'm showing you the same slide again with the timing of the model. When I say rule setting stage, then what I mean is the regulator can restrict the functions that the lender can use and can also decide which explainer they want. So basically what information they will require about the function um, and they do so to, in order to basically maximize their expected welfare where there may be some additional uncertainty about the state. So in that case, I would just integrate over the state. Okay, so I'm now gonna go through a few policy choices that I now have in this model where the lender chooses a credit score function or a decision of who to give credit to and the regulator performs an audit based on a simple explanation. Um, so as a recap, what does the lender observe? The lender basically observes the relation, the true relationship, which I write f of x and u here for the probability of default um, of the 
x variables which have normalized here to um, simplify the exposition um, to the probability of for, um, default. Um, and the lender and the regulator respectively maximize expected um, negative expected loss or um, negative of the maximum of expected loss. And so the first thing that could happen is that I'm not putting any restrictions on the lender at all. So this is just a reference case. So what would happen in that case? Well, in that case, the um, lender simply takes the decision that maximizes their expected utility, which here would just be geared towards the average case. So they would um, take a decision to maximize uh, the position um, averaging over all states of the world, specifically averaging over the high and low states of the world. The regulator, on the other hand, would prefer that the uh, lender is more careful and basically gives a lower credit score to those individuals whose credit, um, whose credit worthiness may be affected negatively in a bad state of the economy, or equivalently would prefer that they don't give credit to risky people, um, and therefore incur a loss here, which is basically the difference between the choice that the regulator makes and the worst case outcome in the bad state. A second thing that the regulator could do is the regulator could say, well, I know that I can't fully explain the function that you may be able to choose, so therefore I'm going to restrict you to simple functions. So I'm going to allow you to only choose functions that only depend on x1, only depend on x2, and I'm assuming that, that those are the functions that a regulator can perfectly understand. Um, and in that case, there would basically be perfectly alignment subject to the restrictions, but it would come at a large cost, um, because now we would be in a world where basically the um, lender cannot react to the information about the relationship of default and the excavates well enough in order to adjust to a given um, world. And that also incurs welfare loss, because the credit decisions are just not as good now. So just to summarize this on a very high level, and basically, in the first case of no restriction, there's no alignment, but there's a lot of flexibility to um, have a function that correctly represents the relationship. In the case of strong ex ante restrictions, there's perfectly alignment, but I'm basically losing a good model of credit scoring. I'm now considering different information constraints where I'm assuming that the regulator can now impose a constraint of saying rather than imposing that you have to choose a simple model, that I can fully explain. I'm instead just saying, you can choose whatever model, and I only look at the explainer, and then I, sh I see whether the explanation of your model conforms with what I want you to do. And in that case, the um, regulator has a decision, which is which kind of explainer do I use. And a standard way of doing that would be to use the explanation of the model that explains most of the variation of the model. So to basically look at the model, which is a model as a function of x1 and x2, and ask, does x1 or x2 explain more of the variation of my outcome variable. Um, and a second thing would be I could instead take the other variable that is in the model. So rather than taking the one that explains most about the variation, I could take the one that in this case is most associated with the, um, with the source of the misalignment. And here's kind of the main point of our paper. So we can do the standard way of explaining a model, which is trying to explain as much of the variation of the outcome variable as possible. And that helps us partly, because now we know something about the model. So in this very concrete case, what we know about is we can now understand the overall level of um, the credit score. And so we can basically force the lender to make sure that the overall level of credit scores is not too high. Um, so that in a bad state, those credit scores are still reflecting relatively well what's going on. But because we are now using an explainer in the first case where we use the explainer that's most associated with explaining the predictive power of the algorithm, we use an explainer that is actually not able to distinguish the effect of the second variable in my algorithm. And now the way that I constructed the algorithm, uh, the example, of course, was that there was one um, variable which was, did you default in the past, which was very important for determined credit worthiness, but it was not actually related specifically to being in a bust or a boom. But there was a second variable, which was, um, do you have a home equity loan of credit, a line of credit, which was less important for explaining credit worthiness, but it was more related to the difference across states. So it was the variable that was adversely affected when I'm in a bad economic state. And so if I'm only explaining things based on the first variable, I'm losing our ability to align on different choices on the second. So I'm partially aligning, but not fully aligning. Well, if instead I'm using an explainer that is specifically attuned to the way that there is misalignment um, between the different 
um, players in my game, so specifically those variables that are related to being in a bust or boom, then in this case I've constructed the example so that I can fully explain um, that difference and the regulator by doing so can basically fully align choices because the simple explanation is still enough to align them because the difference in utility is driven only by um, a subpart of the model that, that can be fully explained. Um, and so basically in this case, the explainer that looks best in terms of describing overall model behavior may not necessarily be the one that is best for regulating. Okay, so just to summarize this on a very high level, so what I've argued here is that we can what we call a prediction explainer, which is an explainer that tries to preserve as much information about the credit scoring function, and that allows us to partially align our choices um, and still retains a lot of um, flexibility for the um, for the lender because we're not making any ex-ante restrictions to simple functions, but we can even do better by using an explainer that specifically is optimized for the specific source of misalignment. Um, and so the idea here is that basically when we try to summarize these very complex functions in simple ways, then we face an inherent trade-off um, between different representations where a representation that preserves most information about some aspects of the model may not preserve as much information about another aspect. And our goal from an economic perspective should be to find one that preserves the information that is most relevant uh, to our economic goal here. Max? So I guess in a way the, the regulator's objective is a one-dimensional thing here, right? So conceptually, kind of basically always ask for this one-dimensional explainer, which is just the regulator's objective. Yeah, so that's a good question. So that's actually, let me go into that now. Um, so I think one question is like, why do we go through that pain? Can't we just say, we just observe the outcome? So basically, I'm just making the one-dimensional explainer the actual welfare. And I'm just saying, I'm restricting you to achieve a certain welfare level. Um, and I now want to discuss in which cases that can help, and in which cases we think that there is still a role for explainability. And for me, the takeaway will be that there will still be a role for explainability. So specifically, so far, I basically assume that the audit, audit uses information from before welfare is realized. Um, so I look at the, the um, function and then I approve it or don't approve it and then it gets deployed. That has some advantages because it allows us to basically uh, decide whether to, say, apply credit score before we've actually waited for disparate impact or a bad state of the economy to materialize. Um, it also allows us to do regulation in cases where what you just mentioned isn't possible because the welfare isn't directly observed. So for example, in credit scoring in the US, the lender would not actually be allowed to use information about protected characteristics, so about people's identity or group identity. And so I may not actually be able to calculate something like disparate impact. Or I may not be able to get a good measurement of the worst case outcome across different states because only one of them will be realized. Finally, I may have limited liability, so I may not necessarily be able to punish arbitrarily based on that. Um, so then there's a question like, what would the role of explainers be if, however, I'm changing the model and I'm allowing the outcome itself to be realized. And so the model that we have in the paper formally still doesn't allow for um, that to help us much. And the reason is a relatively mechanical one because the way that we've written the model. So think of the simple case here where the lender basically takes a decision and there's a high state or a low state. And the lender either takes an aligned decision, so chooses a good function that we like, or chooses a bad one. But then in the high state, choosing the right function gives you a great outcome. In either a badly chosen function or in a low state of the economy, the outcome is just bad, meaning that we see, for example, that there is an excess of default. And so in this case, if I were to punish the agent only based on the realized outcome in the end, for example, in this case, I punish the agent for a bad outcome, they would be forced to take a very conservative decision in the first place. So basically, even when something bad realizes, I may want to know, is this due to a bad choice by the agent, or is it due to um, something that is not under the control of the agent. And then in that case, if all I can learn about the function is basically simple um, explanation, I would still want to at least use that partially. But there are clearly cases where I could improve by combining basically realized outcomes. I think it's very realistic. So what would happen in practice in these exams is that you see a bad outcome. For example, there is excess disparate impact in realized data. And then you're going back and asking, why is that? Is that because, for example, the applicant distribution shifted somehow? Or is that because the function itself was not chosen well. Um, and so we think that right now we, we can partially represent the model, but we want to do more work on basically um, ways of combining both of those with each other. Does that answer the question? Okay. Um, yeah, so basically what I've now argued is that
Thank you. That was very impressive. Um, okay, so first one to point out that of course this example would equally apply to disparate impact case if I simply assume that basically um, the second variable, the x2 variable, is the one that is related to differences um, between groups, meaning that the, the distribution of the x2 variable may differ between groups and the first variable not. So I could have ex used the same very stylized model for this, but impact, but rather than doing that, I now, in um, the last few minutes, I want to show you an empirical example where we actually applied this idea to convince you that there is something interesting here. So specifically, we're using a large um, credit data set um, in which we are building a prediction function for credit card default, where in this case we assume that the lender minimizes prediction loss, so the lender tries to find a function that is um, as good as possible at predicting default, where we express that by the negative log likelihood. Um, and the regulator is interested in minimizing prediction loss plus a penalty for disparate impact. So they don't like it if the two predictions are very different between two different groups in our data, which here would be um, it identified by a minority flag. So we don't want minority applicants to have systematically lower um, credit scores than majority applicants. Um, and the regulator enforces that by basically imposing a audit constraint on the, um, on the lender, which says that the lender has to um, achieve a certain representation of the data, meaning I'm basically forcing the simple representation to conform with what I believe will lead to low disparate impact. And we're implementing that with a neural net with two hidden layers in this case, uh, 40 neurons on 50 covariates. So we're right now extending this to a more complex uh, data set um, and using a larger subsample. So here we're using 400,000. Um, uh, sums of 400,000. And so what are the explainers here? So a best prediction explainer, we are basically using those variables that are most predictive of the outcome itself. So these are the variables that are most predictive of default. And in this case, we're fitting them with just running a logit lasso. So basically just running a sparse linear regression in order to find a group of main drivers. Um, as a stand-in for the target explainer here, instead of explaining the outcome, so whether somebody defaults, we are trying to explain whether somebody is a member of a minority group which is data that we have, but the, um, that the lender would not have. Um, and therefore, we're basically choosing those variables that are most um, indicative of being the minority group in our sample. And the audit constraint in both cases would be that basically the explanation conforms with the explanation of a credit function that we like. Um, and I quickly want to show you this table, but I'm gonna just point out the main features that I find interesting here. So first of all, we are running this with a neural network. We're also running a simple logistic regression that has less covariates and is easier to describe. Um, and in all cases, we are considering explanations that uh, just use a handful, I think in this case, um, use five of the, of the variables in order to explain. Um, and we are comparing how well it does in terms of performance. So log loss was what we cared about, but I also have the area under the curve here um, which we want to maximize in terms of maximizing predictive power. And then we have disparate impact in the right column, which here I'm just taking as the difference in log odds, so which you can think of a credit score, so the average difference in credit score across our two groups. Um, and so first of all, I find it interesting to compare what's going on in the simple versus complex models. So we see a massive improve in predictive power from the simple to the complex models. So it makes a lot of difference here to actually use those more complex models but the baseline disparate impact is also higher. Um, and more than that, the neural net, when I look at different solutions that we calculated here, so specifically focusing on the first two rows, um, the lender or the regulator solution have markedly different levels of disparate impact here, which we've calibrated here um, to be the second half of the first. But when I use the same preferences and I impose them on the logit, I see that with a simpler model, this misalignment is actually not as high even in the baseline. So it looks like that the potential for misalignment here is generally higher for those more complex models, at least in our data set. And we're then considering what happens if we restrict the lender using an explainer that is not optimized for the specific task and using an explainer that is optimized for the specific task. And we are seeing that if you're using the one that is not optimized, we can markedly reduce the split impact. But if you're using the one that's targeted, we actually get it basically all the way down to the desired level. For logistic regression, meanwhile, that difference is not as 
important because I'm just already explaining such a big part of the model using a few variables that the two models are already closely aligned when I'm using whatever explainer I have. Okay, so um, because I'm uh, short on time, I'm gonna skip this. We have some um, graphs that we've been um, working on uh, visualizing this just to show these are the Pareto um, curves if you vary the preference on um, disparate impact going from the firm that doesn't care about disparate impact here to the regulator and showing the difference between basically fairness on the x-axis if you want and fit on the y-axis and showing that basically the complex models can lead to Pareto improvements here relative to the simple models. Um, okay, so um, just to quickly highlight what's going on here. So what's going on is basically that we are choosing two different sets of uh, predictors for the targeted versus the prediction explainer. So the first one is what I get if I just run a lasso on the outcome on the x variables. The second is what I get if I run a lasso uh, on group status. Um, and these are then the coefficients I get for my models. So these are the simple explanation of the models. And the left is um, if I'm using the constrained solution of the lender, the right is if I'm using the preferred solution uh, of the regulator, which we basically are able to run our optimization so that this is very closely aligned, so it kind of works in this way. But more importantly, basically, the um, target explainer is basically able to pick up differences and equalize differences in, um, in aspects of the model that are particularly indicative of a difference between minority and majority groups, and is able to very effectively um, reduce basically the impact that variables have on the outcome that are strongly associated with whether you're a minority or majority applicant. Okay, so I know this is uh, very fast, so I wanna make a, give you a very high level like summary of what I think some of the interesting things is that we learned here. So the starting point is that there is both an opportunity and challenge for regulation as um, lenders move to complex algorithms which is that on the one hand, we can more systematically analyze lending decisions because in many cases, these algorithms may replace human decisions that may be harder to audit. And now we have a mathematical object we can describe. The problem is that this mathematical object is so hard to describe that in many cases, it's reasonable to assume that we cannot fully do so. And then the regulator will only learn some of the aspects of it. And this is in a broader context of an attempt to explain complex machine learning models which I've argued um, has made great progress, but at the same time is often rooted in very axiomatic mathematical or technical approaches. And what we're trying to do here is we counterbalance that by basically taking an economic approach to def defining what explainability should be about or um, describing model here should be about in the specific case. So what we do here, we talk about regulating black box algorithms in a principal agent model, and we give an answer to how that should be done, which is by basically finding simple representations of the functions that are specifically related to the source of misalignment in my problem. And there's a broader related agenda with FinRig Lab, so I've posted here like a cover of the report we brought out uh, two months ago uh, on basically evaluating how well those tools actually do in the wild because they're already used in financial markets and to which degree they're able to um, respond to existing financial regulation or to which degree financial regulation has to evolve in order to accommodate them. All right, thanks a lot for your attention.